All right, this one is called The Wicked Rule in Wrath. And I'd like to start off by reading from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 4 to 6. Take up this proverb against the king of Babel and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. The wicked oppressors which smote the people in anger with a continual plague. The wicked rulers that ruled the nations in wrath. And that is Isaiah chapter 14, verses 4 to 6. Rulers of nations aren't the only ones who rule in wrath. The king of Babel wasn't the only one who smote his victims with incessant anger. The malignant narcissist rules his subject in wrath. He terrorizes his prey in anger. Wrath and anger. The mere prospect of narcissistic wrath is enough to instill fear in the heart of anyone. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. People in the last days will be without natural human affection. People in the last days will be callous, inhuman, and fierce. This is 2 Timothy 3, verse 3. The narcissist tortures and consumes the inner life of his prey with a ferocity that can only be described as wrath. The narcissist is called callous, inhuman, and fierce in this verse we just read, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, one way the narcissist treads on God's temple known as your soul is through simple intimidation. It's easy and fun for the sadistic personality to control through intimidation those he can physically overpower, such as a child or a wife the wicked man rules. The wicked man controls the smaller, weaker vessel through anger and through wrath. This is oppression. And oppression is the biblical term for abuse. <sighs> Excuse me. We read the following in Genesis, Genesis chapter 49, verse 7. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. Now these are the words of Jacob cursing some of his children for their abusive, oppressive behavior. Jacob was under the influence of the Holy Spirit, when he pronounced these curses. The anger, ferocity, wrath, and cruelty of the narcissist is cursed behavior. This is behavior that is cursed, not blessed, cursed by God. 
This is a form of abuse that is cursed by God, particularly when wrath and anger is unleashed on the weak, powerless, and defenseless. Now we read this in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs eleven twenty three. The expectation of the wicked is wrath. And I'd like to read from Gill's commentary on Proverbs eleven twenty three. This is from John Gill. What the wicked is desirous of, what the wicked, abusive man is wishing for and looking for, is wrath and vengeance upon all that displease him and all that angers him. The wicked desires no good to them that displease him, only evil. And I think that's an excellent commentary. Okay, let's look at Isaiah chapter 14 once again in verse 6. It reads that wicked oppressors or wicked abusers smote the people in anger with a continual plague the wicked rulers that ruled in wrath. (coughs) Isaiah 14.6 provides a snapshot of human wrath. Human wrath that proceeds from the heart and mind of the wicked. Wrath that smites its target with angry, incessant blows. Blows to the spirit throwing the sense of right and wrong off balance, confusing the conscience of the target. Narcissistic wrath manifests itself as unrelenting persecution. The victim can't do anything right, and the victim pays. Wrath smites the soul using words and imagery saturated with intimate viciousness, unrelenting blows to the spirit, unrelenting blows to the soul, and many times blows to the body. This is how narcissistic wrath manifests itself to the target The wrath of the abusive personality is fierce, it's ferocious. The wrath of the malignant narcissist is purposefully cruel. There is a reason, (laughs) there's a good reason the malignant narcissist creates an array of false personalities that could fill a wardrobe closet. It's basically to stay out of jail whether that be the invisible social jail or even the material criminal jail. It is to hide. It is to hide their their crimes of unspeakable wrath, ferocity, and cruelty, much less to hide their true self, their true wicked self. Now, does the Bible provide any advice on how we are to interact with a person given over to wrath? It does. It's in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24. It reads, Make no friendships with a man given to anger, and with a wrathful man do not associate. The scripture is clear. Avoid all entanglements of obligation with a man given to anger. Do not yoke yourself with a person who bullies you or others in any interpersonal capacity. This instruction found in Proverbs has no qualifiers, such as family or spouse. It is all-inclusive. 
Now, when Scripture teaches, do not make a friend with an angry man, when it teaches no friendship, it means no covenant, no agreement, no bond, no covenant of any sort or degree. That, that would include marriage. <clears throat> Ruling over another human being in wrath is covenant-breaking behavior. It is betrayal of a covenant. There is no friendship between oppressor and oppressed or between abuser and abused. And the covenant between them is null and void. There is no covenant there when you have an oppressor-oppressed dynamic. There's no friendship there. Now the stir the, the stir the state and the church might recognize a covenant bond but God does not God does not bless the wicked man and I might add this he's not going to use you in any capacity to bless him God judges the wicked man. We are told to have no associations with a wrathful man. It's so crystal clear, I don't think it requires any additional commentary on my part, really. I wrote that, but it's true. It's pretty clear. No association means no association. Amen. Thank you.